So I said I'd give some examples, and I will. So we'll look again, first of all, for the power magnet example. So I'll show you how you can use this equation to find the properties of the power magnet, rather than going directly from the numbers of microstates or the entropy. Before I do that, we started this theory part by considering system one, which is the thing we want to understand, connected to a thermal reservoir system two. But if you look at these equations, you now see that we've got rid of all of the twos, right? There's no U2 or W2. So that means in what follows, I will get rid of the units one as well. So we're only interested in one system, and I'll just call the energy of that system U and the number of my states W and so on. Okay. But you must always remember that although I write it like this, we're always considering this system in contact with another thermal reservoir at thermal equilibrium. But in, in what follows, I will forget about the reservoir in that I won't write numbers 1 here. I'll just write U and W. But it means the same thing. Okay. Right, so what kind of thing can we calculate from Z? An example of something we can calculate is the average energy. The average energy of the system I'll just write like this. The mean, in other words, the mean energy. U. So we've seen the formula for mean energy before. Well, the definition of mean is that it's equal to the sum of the sum over all possible values of the energy, but the probability of that value multiplied by the value itself. Okay? This is definition of a mean, right? But now we have a, a formula for P in terms of in terms of the um, distribution of microstates if I write this down this is the sum on u of u and p of u is w of u times e to the minus u over kbt divided by the sum let me write it, I'll do it in two steps. Divided by the partition function C. That's just putting in explicitly what is P of U from the formula we'd found before the break. Now if I write this down in terms of, put Z explicitly in terms of the number of microstates using that formula over there, this becomes sum upon U of U, W of U, e to the minus u over kbt divided by z, which is the sum upon u times w of u times e to the minus u over kbt. So I've just put the explicit formula for z in there. And you see this is interesting. The top and the bottom look virtually the same in this equation, right? The top and the bottom look virtually the same. The only difference is there's an extra U on the top. There's a U here on the top, which is not on the bottom. So this is not simply identity. But we can write this down simply in terms of the partition function. In particular, this is equal to, I'll explain why in a moment, this is equal to KB times t squared times the derivative d by dt of the log of this sum. So let me explain why. So this thing I told you is just some function of t, right? So the first fact is, if I differentiate d by dt, of some, the log of some function of t,
then this is just equal to, we've done this before actually last week, the derivative of the function divided by the original function. So you see that if I differentiate with respect to t here, I get 1 over this, which gives me exactly what I've got there. And also I get the derivative of f prime, sorry, the derivative of f, what is that? If f of t is some constant, that constant doesn't matter, e to the minus u over kt, like it is here, then when, the, when I differentiate a function like this, I get the f prime of t. I differentiate this with respect to t, that gives me u over kbt squared times e to the minus u over kbt. So you see now that this formula works. I differentiate the log, that gives me 1 over this thing, and that gives me what I've got on the bottom here. Then when I differentiate f, which looks like this, I get u over kbt squared, and here I just want a u, so finally I multiply by kbt squared. So this kbt squared here cancels this, this u here goes into the sum here, and I get f prime over f, which gives me these two sums here and here. So hopefully you convince yourself that this formula is correct. And you see that simply this is the partition function, so we get the final result that u, average energy, is equal to kb t squared times the derivative d by dt of the log of the partition function. So this is an example of how we can work out a thermodynamic property, like the energy, from a knowledge of the partition function. And we can again think about the thermodynamic limit. We've calculated the probability distribution, but we expect that in the thermodynamic limit, when the system becomes large, the probability distribution should be sharp, becomes narrow, and therefore, this mean is very close to the, well, this mean is the most probable and the only probable value of energy U. So we can replace this with a definite value. In the thermodynamic limit, we expect T of U to become narrow. So I can draw these pictures again. In a small system, if I draw P of U as a function of U, it may have some wide distribution like this. It doesn't have to be symmetric. But as the system gets larger, we expect that the distribution should become sharp. Like this. So here, the average value is somewhere here. But in the large-scale system, the average value is the only likely value. So this means we can treat the average value u as being the definite value u of the system when it's at temperature t. So we can treat u as a definite value in other words the the mean of u is just what the is the likely value of the energy of the system at temperature t
So in the thermodynamic limit, we expect that the energy as a function of temperature is given by this derivative of the log of the partition function. So in a moment, we'll do the calculation explicitly for the paramagnet to show you how it works. Before that, I just want to make a note because we've assumed that the partition function only depends upon temperature, whereas in fact it can depend upon other system properties like the volume and the field and so on. So, so far we've supposed simply that the entropy and the partition function and so on is only a function of the energy. Um, where it can be a function of the other state property. So if the number of microstates u, w, is a function not only of u, but of also some other state properties x, as I said, it can be volume or magnetic field or particle number, whatever. then this partition function z is also dependent upon these state parameters. Okay. Function of temperature, temperature of the reservoir, and these state parameters. And in this case, we have to replace this full derivative with the partial derivative u is equal to kb t squared times the partial derivative with respect to temperature, keeping the other things constant. This, and in the thermodynamic limit, this gives you a function of energy as a function of temperature and the other state properties. So there's nothing particularly complicated, but if there are other variables which affect the number of microstates, then they also affect the canonical partition function like this, and the energy as a function of temperature like this. So now let me show you how it works for the paramagnet. So the formula is z is a function of t, and in this case it also depends upon field h, and it's defined as the sum over microstates m okay. here m is, is a very bad choice because M is also like, okay, so let me call microstates mu of e to the minus energy, energy of the microstate, which also depends upon the field in this case, divided by the Boltzmann factor, kbt. Uh, okay. Mu is also a bad choice because mu is the <laughs> magnetic moment, isn't it? Um, was another letter. K is bad. <laughs> this is a problem you tend to run out of letters. Okay, let me call it microstate eta. I'm pretty sure we haven't used eta before. There we go. Okay, so eta labels the microstates, H labels the field. So here, for the paramagnet, eta is the microstate. This is telling you the spin of every, the direction of every spin in the system. So it's a vector s1, s2, s3, up to sn, where si, I've said this before, can take plus or values, plus or minus 1, which corresponds to spin up, spin down. So the microstate eta is a vector of n numbers where each number is plus or minus 1.
And the energy, u, eta, and h, is, well, each spin has an energy equal to minus mu h times the si. So the total energy is the sum, i goes from 1 to n, minus mu h times si. So now I can put these two things into this formula here. So we get that the partition function Z. So first of all, the sum over microstates is the sum over all possible values of S, I, and each S, I can take plus or minus one. So this becomes a sum S1, Sn, take values plus or minus one. We have to sum over. So really, this is n sums, right? Sum s1, sum s2, sum s. Okay, and the energy is there, so the minus is cancelled, and I just get mu h times the sum i goes from one to n s i divided by k v t, and this is something which we can calculate because. You see, in the equation here, we've got a sum in the exponential. And whenever you have a sum in the exponential, you can use the relationship that the sum in the exponential, e to the a plus b, is just the product of exponentials e to the a times e to the b. Right? So I can split this sum into a product of exponentials, and this allows me to write it as n separate sums. So S1 goes from plus or minus 1. And the term which depends upon S1 is just e to the mu h S1 over kvt. That's the term which depends upon S1. Then I've got when i equals 2, I get the sum S2 plus or minus 1 e to the mu h times S2 over kvt. And this goes all the way up to n. So the last term is the sum Sn plus or minus 1 times E to the mu h Sn over kvt. Okay, so this step often confuses people for some reason. So what, what I've done is this is a sum in the exponential, right? So here is S1 plus S2 plus S3 and so on. I can use this relationship to write it as a product of exponentials. And then each exponential only depends upon one of the S's. So I can separate the sums into n terms like this. This is now a huge simplification, and this is the reason, well, the main reason why the canonical partition function is often easy to calculate. This has now split the sum into n identical sums. This sum here is the same as this sum here is the same as this sum here. So all of the sums look the same. This is to, related to the fact that there are no interactions between the spins. So I can write this as a single sum s equals plus or minus 1 times e to the mu h s over k b t to the power n. And now finally I can just do this sum. There's only two terms in it. So s is plus 1 or s is minus 1. So this is when s is 1 I get mu h over k b t. When s is minus 1, I get minus mu h over kvt. And all of this goes to the power n. And following on from what I said last time about trigger hyperbolic functions, this is the hyperbolic Cauch function. So we can summarize this calculation. We can summarize this calculation by saying that the partition function for the paramagnet 
is two hyperbolic cosine of mu h over kvt to the power n. So that, that may seem slightly complicated, but you should compare this calculation we've just done, the calculation of z, t and h, to the calculation we did before where we found the entropy as a function of u and h. So this is the calculation we did last week. This is the calculation we've done now. Look back in your notes and compare them, and you'll see that this one is easier. This calculation I managed to do in, what, two, two whiteboards. Whereas this one, because I had to do the Stirling approximation and so on, this one took about four or five whiteboards for me to write. So in general, this is easier to calculate than this. Okay? So we found it. Let's use it to calculate the average energy then. And check that it agrees with what we found before. So the energy U, T, and H is KB t squared d by dt at constant h of the log of z that's the formula we just worked out before the break oh no just after the break sorry now in this case z looks like this the n when i take a log the n just comes down to the front so this is equal to equal to n a b t squared times d by dt of the log cosh. And the 2 is a constant, right? Log 2 is a constant, so that also disappears. Mu h over k b t. And now it's just a matter of doing the calculus. So when you differentiate log, I get 1 over cosh times the derivative of cosh. And the derivative of cosh is hyperbolic sine, cinch. So this gives you n k b t times hyperbolic sine mu h over k b t divided by hyperbolic cosine mu h kbt times the derivative of this thing in here with respect to temperature and it's like 1 over the temperature so that gives you minus 1 over temperature squared so I get minus mu h over kb t squared And this is the final answer. Sine over cos is tan. So hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cos is hyperbolic tan. So, and you see that kBt on the bottom cancels with kBt on the top. Sorry, there's a t squared here. kBt squared on the top, so that all cancels. So I'm left with u is minus n times mu times h from here, mu h n. And then sine over cos is tan, so I get hyperbolic tan tangent of mu h over kbt. And you can look back in your notes and you'll find that indeed this is the same as we calculated before. So when we calculated it directly from the entropy, we get exactly the same answer as we calculated now using the canonical partition function. And this shows you that the two approaches are equivalent. Right? I can use the function of entropy, this one, to find this result. Or I can use the partition function to find the same result. 